Milestones in Medicine is produced by American Medical Communications. This Milestones in Medicine learning kit is funded through an unrestricted educational grant provided by Janssen Pharmaceutica. This Milestones in Medicine learning kit is available for continuing medical education credit. See details following the program. Where would you like the first one? Arthur Schwartz performs well on the Wisconsin card sorting test. He should. He has no extra pyramidal symptoms, no akathisia, no anticholinergic side effects to disrupt his concentration. Moreover, his thought processes, his cognitive functions are in order. Arthur has had schizophrenia for 25 years, but his thoughts are clear. He drives a car. He holds a job. His ability to think clearly is a testimony to treatment success. In schizophrenia, there are several ways to measure therapeutic response. But is cognitive function the most important? In the next half hour, we'll be given evidence that it is, and that progress is being made toward preserving or restoring cognitive function, and we'll see how it may have a major impact on outcome. In fact, cognitive function has become an area of significant interest at several clinical and research centers. We'll hear from experts at three. Dr. William Wershing is a professor of clinical psychiatry at UCLA School of Medicine and works at the West Los Angeles VA Medical Center. He's been looking at types of cognitive function and how they affect the course of chronic disease. Dr. Lily Coppola is an associate professor of psychiatry at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She has an interest in how drug selection affects cognitive function in first break patients. Dr. Philip Harvey, professor of psychiatry at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City, has been active evaluating the role of cognitive deficits in the elderly. Schizophrenia is a disease that involves thought disorder. It is therefore not very surprising that cognitive function is often impaired. In fact, cognitive deficits were identified among core components when the construct of dementia praecox was described at the end of the 19th century. However, cognitive function has been given relatively little attention as a clinical endpoint, at least until now. Why are we talking about it now? I mean, typically thought of schizophrenia during the last, oh, couple of decades is being divided grossly into positive symptoms, an excess of symptoms which should not be present, and negative symptoms, a deficiency of symptoms or behavioral states which should be present. Presently, however, people have begun to conceptualize the schizophrenic condition as a three-compartment, tri-compartment model, positive and negative symptoms, but in addition, neurocognitive embarrassment. Let me say that cognitive deficits are pervasive in schizophrenia. The deficits that are commonly seen are related to higher order thinking, what we call executive function, making decisions. For example, what, one, what constitutes judgment, making important decisions in certain settings. Memory can be interfered with, and uh, attention. Research has shown in the past that the level of cognitive functioning is strongly associated with the course of illness in schizophrenia. Patients who have a chronic course of illness almost uniformly have more cognitive impairment than patients who have a more episodic course. Patients who successfully live in the community are identified by their more intact cognitive functioning than those patients who require more supportive living arrangements. The negative impact of cognitive impairment is relevant to every stage of illness. In the young first break patients, cognitive impairment, once the psychoses are controlled, may be the number one hurdle to piecing back together a disrupted life. As we just heard, cognitive impairment in patients with chronic disease can stand in the way of independent living. In elderly patients, cognitive dysfunction can limit quality of life and functional capacities. What many clinicians aren't aware of is the fact that the best predictor of outcome, more important than positive symptoms, more important than negative symptoms, 
is the level of cognitive functioning of the patients. Cognition is a broad term encompassing an array of intellectual processes. The major categories include memory, language, visuospatial skills, abstraction, and attention. In particular, in schizophrenia, it's the frontal systems which appear to be most specifically and severely affected. So measures of executive functioning, planning, speed of processing, vigilance, attention, concentration, uh, verbal fluency. Those are the measures which seem to be associated with the schizophrenic condition and have really become the focus of the neuropsychologists and as well as the, the treating clinicians who deal with patients with schizophrenia. Well, there are several different types of cognitive functioning that, uh, that when they are impaired, do appear to predict worse outcome, particularly in the adaptive domain. That tends to be different aspects of memory functioning, both working memory as well as what's called secondary memory, which is practice-related learning and delayed recall of information. The ability to sustain attention to information in the environment is also quite important as is ability to use executive functioning. All these distinctions are of major interest to researchers. But for the clinician, the critical question is, does the patient have the skills to navigate daily life? Of the measures, executive function is among the most important. Now, executive functioning is the ability to, in a sense, coordinate component skills in cognition, such as allocating your attention effectively, solving problems, and knowing what strategies to apply in certain di in different environmental circumstances. For the clinician, the challenge is, how can I enhance cognitive function? It's now clear that cognitive function can be impaired, independent of positive or negative symptoms. Even when positive psychotic symptoms are controlled, even when negative psychotic symptoms are controlled, cognitive deficits may persist. It appears as though positive symptoms if severe, do disrupt a person's testing, but the symptoms themselves are not strongly correlated with persistent neurocognitive embarrassment, such that if you take a person with, with very substantial positive symptoms, yes, they're going to perform less well on a variety of neurocognitive measures. However, if you improve those, the neurocognition improves, but only to a degree. Interestingly enough, the correlation across many different studies looking at both first episode, chronic, and episodically ill patients with schizophrenia, has suggested that the severity of delusions and hallucinations is uncorrelated with the severity of cognitive impairment, meaning that it's possible that in some patients there's an interference with testing, but as a general rule, the correlation tends to be zero in that there's no relationship between them. There is a much stronger correlation between cognitive deficits and negative symptoms. But still, negative symptoms and cognitive deficits remain independent measures of disease severity. Well, once again, one of the things that people see is that some patients with schizophrenia are uncooperative or unresponsive. Obviously, patients like that can't be tested at all. Uh, within the realm of patients who you can test, the correlation between negative symptoms and cognitive impairments is high, but it's not the same phenomenon. Studies over time have suggested that it's quite possible to distinguish between aspects of negative symptoms that are related to cognitive impairments and those that are independent of cognitive impairments. What we've been able to ascertain is that even after we treat people effectively and diminish voices, and free people from some of the delusional thinking they've had, or even address some of the more negative symptoms like blunted affect or poverty of speech, that is the inability to generate speech, that they still are left with uh, impairment in cognitive function. One obstacle to addressing cognitive impairment is that most therapies actually exacerbate deficits. Clearly, sedating drugs, either antipsychotics or adjunctive anticholinergic agents, are hardly ideal for attention and learning. But there is good evidence that some antipsychotic agents have other negative effects on thought processing as well. Typical antipsychotic medications such as haloperidol do interfere with thinking. And then you add to that the anticholinergic medication you need to give for the movement side effects, and you compromise thinking even further. 
The effect of anticholinergic medications on cognition is well known. If we, for instance, give conventional antipsychotics to normal individuals, individuals without any hint of schizophrenia, in single dose studies, it seems as though even the high potency conventional drugs impair things like attention, concentration, and vigilance. So they do appear to have in their own right some attenuation of normal neurocognition. Not all agents appear to produce the same negative impact on cognition. In fact, some antipsychotic agents appear to have favorable effects. The first hint that this was true was produced in empirical observations with clozapine, an atypical antipsychotic. Now there are controlled studies that tell the same story. These have been conducted with both clozapine and risperidone, another atypical antipsychotic. It's been demonstrated in some pilot studies that treatment with atypical neuroleptic medications have the potential to enhance certain aspects of cognitive functioning relative to treatment with typical neuroleptics. For example, treatment with clozapine has reliably been shown to improve performance on verbal fluency tests relative to treatment with haloperidol, and treatment with risperidone has been demonstrated to improve performance in reaction time, in speeded visual motor tasks, and in working memory compared to treatment with typical neuroleptic medication. And it does appear that across a variety of measures, measures of vigilance, concentration, uh, executive functioning, that patients in the conventionally treated class perform less well than the patients in the, in the, in the atypical class with, say, clozapine or in our experience in the, in the trial that I'm speaking of with risperidone. At first, it was presumed that adjunctive use of anticholinergic drugs explained these differences. Patients on clozapine and risperidone have a low risk of extrapyramidal symptoms, EPS, and therefore do not need these adjunctive therapies. However, when investigators at UCLA controlled for anticholinergic drug use, the atypical agents retained their superiority. So you would expect, because of the known neurocognitive embarrassment associated with antimuscarinic compounds, you'd expect the conventionally treated group to perform less well. That was our hypothesis. However, when you statistically control for the differential use of anticholinergics, the patients treated with risperidone still perform better. It's as, though, it's as though the drug itself, the molecule itself, is associated with better neurocognitive functioning than the conventional drug, irrespective of the differential use of anticholinergics. In comparing antipsychotic drugs, researchers have been looking to relative activities at specific neurotransmitter receptors. These are thought to be relevant to both benefits and risks. Although the role of these relative differences remains theoretical, Attention has been drawn to serotonin, or 5-HT activity, and the ratio of dopamine to serotonin blockade. One of the other biological basis of effect of these atypical drugs may be due to their 5-H2A receptor blockade. In animal studies, it's been shown that 5-H2A receptor antagonism increases the level of dopamine release in the cortex. Since cortical hypodopaminergia has been at least cross-sectionally or correlationally associated with cognitive impairment, it might, this might be the mechanism of action through which atypical neuroleptic medications have the potential to augment cognitive functioning. Studies with atypical agents have now posed a major challenge to the dopamine hypothesis. This hypothesis suggested that antipsychotic activity is primarily mediated by blockade of the D2 receptor, but atypical agents have less relative activity at the D2 receptor. This may explain their reduced risk for EPS and other movement side effects. It may also explain the cognitive differences. Uh, an interesting study done by uh, Frith and his colleagues uh, suggested that typical antipsychotic medications uh, were in part effective in the treatment of the symptoms of schizophrenia by Parkinsonizing um, the frontostriatal systems which were involved in the generation of willed actions and expectancies. It's an interesting construct, an interesting way of looking at why thinking is so interfered with by typical potent D2 blocking agents. Potential differences between atypical agents for relative effect on cognition is another exciting area of research. Drugs within the atypical class can also be differentiated for their relative neurotransmitter activity. In fact, clozapine is associated with some anticholinergic effects, including sedation, that may impair cognitive performance.
This was seen in a German study comparing haloperidol, clozapine, and risperidone. What Professor Galhofer uh, and his team were also able to show is that although people receiving clozapine were able to move faster, that is, they could move through the mazes faster, they made more errors. People receiving risperidone functioned better, that is, they were able to move through the mazes without having the movement problems, so they weren't slowed down, and they were able to use decision-making abilities uh, more effectively. Just like typical neuroleptic medications, atypical neuroleptics also vary in their anticholinergic effects. Some have essentially none, and others are fairly potent uh, blockers of the muscarinic receptor sites. So as a consequence, it might be expected that across eight atypical neuroleptic medication, there's some variability in their intrinsic anticholinergic effect and its impact on cognition. While these differences are intriguing, more exciting is the fact that clinicians can already make therapeutic choices that will have an impact on cognition. The clinical implications of restoring this area of functioning are enormous. It's a blinding glimpse of the obvious that if you're having difficulties with memory, with attention, with making decisions, thinking that it's going to affect every aspect of living. Whether you've gone downstairs to get something and forget what it is you've gone downstairs for or whether you're trying to finish your grade 12, for example, your high school, whether you're trying to complete university, whether you're trying to do retraining to, to get a job, whether you're trying to do the job. Some research has clearly shown that patients with schizophrenia who have certain types of cognitive impairments, particularly memory impairments, are much slower to learn new skills than patients who are less cognitively impaired. They have a harder time learning job skills and social skills. And as a consequence, there is a direct relationship between cognitive impairment and the ability to improve patients functioning who have schizophrenia. If somebody remains derailed, if you will, in terms of their thinking ability, for a long period of time, it's going to be very difficult for them to re-enter their lifeline and get on with their lives. So the sooner we're able to treat and treat effectively with medications that people can take, the better the outcome's going to be. Relative cognitive function is potentially important in every patient population. I think it's important to keep in mind that studies of geriatric patients with schizophrenia suggest it's never too late to consider a change in medication status. In three different studies that have been completed to date, it's been found that relative to previous treatment with typical neuroleptic medication, treatment with risperidone is reliably associated with a three, three or more point improvement in mini mental state exam scores. In these studies, even patients with the worst baseline scores improved. Patients whose baseline mini mentals were in the mid 20s improved to the same extent as patients whose baseline mini-mentals were in the mid-teens or less than 10, suggesting that regardless of the severity of cognitive impairment, a switch to a, a medication that has the potential to enhance cognition may have a beneficial effect. The opportunity to make therapeutic choices that favorably influence cognitive function is new, but it's a reorientation that is already well underway. I think presently it's important for clinicians to consider that a selection of one or another antipsychotic drugs or adjunctive strategies might embarrass or help neurocognition is important. I think our goal needs to be to be able to treat somebody who has psychotic symptoms with an effective antipsychotic medication which they can tolerate at the right dose, which they can take longer term without any other side effect medications no anticholinergics, no benzodiazepines. That's our goal. Monotherapy, it's a unique concept in uh, psychiatry because prior to the last four years, we didn't have that available to us. It's a major breakthrough. It may be that for the first time in the last century, we're at the point where we have the potential to change the outcome of the illness. And I think the approach that's being adopted now is going to be very beneficial, regardless of whether the specific atypical neuroleptic medications available now have maximally beneficial effects. 
This approach is going to be important and it's going to be standard in the development of new drugs for the treatment of this illness. In fact, there is evidence that control of psychoses and positive symptoms has always been an inadequate goal in itself. This was the startling conclusion of a study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Despite a series of major advances over many decades, not least being the development of chlorpromazine, overall outcomes in the 1980s were found comparable to those of the 1890s. The proportion of patients with schizophrenia who are living successfully in the community and sustaining employment, however, was the same in 1985 as it was back in the last century. That would suggest that the introduction of typical neuroleptic medication, although it reduced lots of the symptoms of schizophrenia, particularly positive symptoms, has had no impact on the overall adaptive outcome of schizophrenia. Like positive or negative symptoms, there are wide interpatient differences in cognitive dysfunction. Again, this is an independent sphere of disease activity, so that some individuals may benefit more than others from drugs which favorably influence cognition. As to the question of whether every single patient with schizophrenia has some neurocognitive embarrassment or impairment, the answer is probably no. Um, there are certainly people that function at a superior intellectual and functional level with schizophrenic illness. However, compared to how they would function intellectually without any difficulties from schizophrenia, probably there is some, albeit small, neurocognitive embarrassment for virtually all patients with schizophrenia. At some centers, cognitive assessments are now being included as a regular part of patient evaluation. There are several different reasons that you'd want to do a cognitive assessment on a patient with schizophrenia. If it's an early phase of illness patient, someone in their first episode, for example, you'd want to get some information about their level of cognitive functioning and what you think that implies about their overall prognosis. Anyone who comes to a healthcare provider, a physician, with a first episode of psychosis, because of the implications, the long-term implications of having chronic illness, and a severe chronic illness at that, deserves to have a very thorough investigation, which would include neurocognitive assessment, full assessment for all of the usual symptoms of um, psychotic illness, as well as brain imaging. So it's all part of a package um, of an assessment that I think is essential to do. For a more chronic patient, for example, it's important to know for placement purposes. Patients who are most cognitively impaired may not be manageable outside a state hospital or nursing home situation, while those who are less cognitively impaired would be more likely to succeed in a supported community residence or even independently. Some of the neurocognitive tests that we do on a routine basis have been computerized, and it makes it fun for individuals to do. So they sit at a computer, for example, and are given instructions um, by a neuropsychologist and try to perform the task. Those data can then be analyzed uh, very carefully at a later point and systematically analyzed. There are a number of other tasks which we ask um, people to do as well, which relate to their ability to use particularly their left hemisphere or their right hemisphere. The clinical neuropsychological tests that are used to assess schizophrenia are the tests that have been in common clinical use for the last 30 or 40 years in clinical neuropsychology. These tests are well understood, they're highly reliable, and the, the importance of performance deficits on these tests in patients with other neurological and neuropsychiatric conditions is quite well understood. It's possible to assess patients with schizophrenia quite comprehensively in an hour and a half to two hours with careful selection of tests. All the important aspects of cognitive functioning that predict outcome of the illness can easily be assessed within two hours. In clinical practice, the most commonly used tests are the mini mental status examination, the Wisconsin card sorting test, and the revised Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. However, not all experts agree that we know how to apply results in routine clinical management. I don't think we yet know exactly what tests to measure. I don't think we yet know exactly when we should get those in reference to the, inter the, 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 the antipsychotic intervention. 
I think at this point the details of measurement with the measures per se should be left to, uh, to research, though probably down the road they're going to be embedded into, into routine clinical strategies. Even when formal cognitive testing is not employed, this important clinical variable should be monitored empirically. The goals of treatment are becoming more ambitious. Specifically, optimal therapy should control positive symptoms, control negative symptoms, improve cognitive function, and avoid significant side effects. There are still a small percentage of people who never get well enough perhaps to live independently, but that percentage is ever shrinking. But we're aiming for better outcome. And better outcome means being in relationships, having a job, perceiving that your quality of life is um, enhanced, thinking, problem solving, having your memory work for you. So that's why I think the emphasis is now on uh, more on cognition, is because we've been better able to address the other symptoms and focus on achieving a higher level of functioning. I think that atypical neuroleptic medication has the potential to change the treatment landscape in schizophrenia. Much like when chlorpromazine was introduced in the 1950s, there was a treatment revolution in that positive symptoms were controlled for the first time. The effects of atypical neuroleptic medications on treatment refractory patients and their potential for enhancement of some of the critical aspects of cognitive impairment in schizophrenia has the potential to start a second biological treatment revolution for the illness. It's important to recognize that we are just at the beginning of this major revolution. Work with atypical agents such as risperidone and clozapine is permitting pioneering work toward isolating the effects of antipsychotic drugs and paving the way for drugs with even greater specificity of action. The research is very exciting. For example, imaging studies with such tools as functional magnetic resonance imaging are permitting researchers to evaluate brain function under the influence of specific drugs while the patient performs cognitive tasks. And that, I think, eventually will drive our understanding of what is going on in the brain when somebody's having difficulty doing a specific task and then to assess how a particular medication may enhance or interfere with that functioning. It's this kind of technology, the molecular science end of things, that is enabling us, I think, to develop superior treatments based on better understanding. I don't think there's any question, but this is, this is a field of the future. I mean, now we're seeing greater collaboration among basic scientists, neuropsychologists, treating clinicians, patients, caregivers, etc., examining this field than ever before. In this program, we've learned that cognitive impairments occur independent of positive and negative symptoms, that these impairments may be the most important predictor of outcome, and that antipsychotic therapies can be differentiated for their relative effect on cognition. Advances in this area are providing one of the most exciting opportunities to restore patients with schizophrenia even closer to a life near normal. The Dana Miller Memorial Educational Foundation is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to sponsor continuing medical education for physicians. The Dana Miller Memorial Educational Foundation designates this continuing medical education activity for two credit hours in Category 1 of the Physician's Recognition Award of the American Medical Association. The Dana Miller Memorial Educational Foundation is a provider by the California Board of Registered Nursing, provider number 04229. This program is approved as a continuing education activity for two contact hours. Texas Pharmacy Foundation is approved by the American Council on Pharmaceutical Education as a provider of continuing pharmaceutical education. The Dana Miller Memorial Educational Foundation is solely responsible for the content of this continuing medical education activity. This CME activity was planned and produced in accordance with the ACCME essentials. The preceding program was funded through an unrestricted educational grant provided by Janssen Pharmaceutica.